Uh, sorry for doing some last minute edits to the questions. No, it's. Okay, so it's 10 o'clock. We will start our first session of the day. So we'll be doing a, an open graphics tell by Elisa Rosenzweig. Hi, Elisa. Hello. Okay. So this would be an interview style talk where I have collected some questions I would like to ask Elisa. So Elisa, how did you get started with graphics? Sure. I, a number of years ago, I bought an ARM Chromebook. Uh, it was, at the time, uh, the newest machine that was supported by the uh, Libreboot firmware, a uh, fully free software distribution core boot. And so it was interesting for that, for that sense. The system on chip was completely supported with uh, open, open source drivers, except the GPU. <laughs> the, uh, there was this Mali T760 GPU, and it was the big blocker to being able to use this device uh, without any uh, closed source components. And uh, so I got to work reverse engineering it, and it was a very slow start. Uh, had, I was working with a number of other folks, uh, uh, Paul, Connor Abbott, and, uh, and, but eventually we did make some early progress, and uh, those, effort, those early efforts uh, evolved into the uh, Ampros stack, which uh, I'm very happy to say we're going to provide uh, pretty good graphic acceleration on that, that same laptop. It's not the one I use anymore, but uh, it's how I got started, at least. So it's about getting your hands on the right hardware, I guess. <laughs> Apparently, having this to scratch. Okay. So for the Penfrost graphic stack, which kernel and user space components does the does they comprise of, and how do they work together? So for any modern graphic stack, there are two two drivers working in concert. There is the small the smaller kernel driver and the generally much larger user space driver. The job of the kernel driver is to provide a safe abstraction to the hardware, uh, so it handles very low level details. Uh, submit, submitting work to the, to the hardware, uh, allocating memory, mapping memory, or uh, scheduling jobs, that sort of thing. Um, and it does so in a way that there, it, it's able to present an interface of the hardware that is uh, secure, even to untrusted uh, users. Uh, the main technique to do this is going to be uh, uh, virtual addresses and address, separate address space so this for each process. So if there's a malicious process that allocates and maps memory, um, 
it can't cause problems for other process. At least that's, that's the theory. So it's a, the kernel space component is a very low level, generally small security focused uh, extraction. And it provides uh, within those bounds almost direct access to the hardware. So the user space component is where the, uh, the meat of the driver lives. This goes everywhere from uh, the translating down uh, the commands issued by an application, the OpenGL application, Vulkan, or OpenCL, as the case may be, translating it down to the hardware. Uh, if there are uh, shaders, which is the case for modern API, uh, this is where you have the shader compiler taking in the high level GLSL or Spurby code and compiling it down to the hardware and instructions. Uh, and eventually preparing all of the memory, all of the data structures needed by the hardware, all of the compiled shaders, and uh, submitting the work off to the kernel to actually submit it to the hardware. Uh, this is the architecture that, as I said, uh, all the modern drivers are going to use. Uh, it does not make sense to put all of the complexity of the user space driver into kernel space because that's going to have that's going to increase your attack surface. From a security perspective, and it's going to be worse from a performance standpoint. Likewise, trying to manage the hardware directly in user space is going to have its own security issues because of the um, failure to isolate processes from each other. So, this is the stack we have. Actually, let me check one thing for a bit. Uh, for those guys sitting in the back, could you hear Alisa okay? Okay. Good on Sorry. Hello, people in the back. <laughs> okay. All right. Moving on. So, what is the relationship between the open source drivers listed on the official webpage of ARM and the master upstream drivers? Are there any kind of cooperation between the two? Right. So, the uh, so called open source drivers that ARM lists for the Molly devices. Uh, it's, they're only talking about that smaller kernel piece. Uh, the driver that ARM provides on that page, and this goes for all of the Molly GPUs, uh, is just the piece in the kernel that just handles the memory management and the submission of work. Uh, it notably is missing sort of everything interesting about the driver stack. Uh, there's, no, there's obviously no shader compiler in there. You're not going to be compiling shader in the kernel. If you did, I would have questions. <laughs> um, there is no uh, hardware data structures in there for the most part. The closest you'll get is a couple cases where there is a hardware bug that the, that the kernel needs to work around and then ARM is forced to uh, have some of those details leak in the kernel space. But by and large, uh, these are not open source drivers. These, this is a small open source piece of a larger closed source driver. Um, so that's the first answer that Mesa is implementing the, the part of the driver stack that would be closed source on our, on our side. Uh, that being said, I did say that there is the Penfrost kernel, uh, which implements the same functions more or less as the ARM open source modeling kernel, which is uh, you're asking about here. Uh, the reason that the Penfrost team had to re uh, essentially rewrite this driver is because ARM's driver, uh, at the moment at least, is not suitable for upstream inclusion. Uh, it is. Uh, it does not use the abstractions that are expected of an upstream uh, kernel graphics driver. Notably, it's not based on the common direct rendering management or DRM core. Not, not the bad kind of DRM, the good kind of DRM in the kernel. Um, uh, so there is a large amount of code related to memory management and scheduling, which is all duplicating what is already in the kernel. Uh, and from ARM's perspective, I'm sure there were good reasons to do it this way, uh, but it's not, this is not code that will end up in the main line Linux kernel. Uh, by contrast, the much smaller, in terms of source lines of code, uh, pen for us kernel driver did make its way upstream into Linux 5.2 and is now the preferred stack. So 
And the net result is that we have the upstream Pencross kernel driver that works with the upstream Mesa, and that gives you a fully open source stack. And in parallel, there's the open source downstream non upstreamable uh, ARM kernel driver that only makes sense to use with the closed source ARM stack. Uh, in principle, you could mix and match. Uh, if, if you wanted to, you could use, um, you could run the Mesa uh, user space on top of the ARM open source kernel space. Uh, in principle, there's not a lot of reason to do that for the hardware that Mesa currently supports, um, especially given that that's not an upstream driver. Um, and so we don't support we don't support that. In the other direction, in principle, you could run the closed source ARM ARM stack on top of the mainline driver, but that would likely require ARM cooperation uh, too, because that's closed source. How can you make those changes yourself? Uh, so the net result is that we're in this sort of stasis of two parallel stacks. Nice. So let me try to paraphrase. See if I got got it straight. So the piece that ARM open sourced is really like a small piece of their proprietary graphics stack. And sure. that's the in-kernel component. But since it's not suitable for upstreaming, since it doesn't use common kernel infrastructure like the direct rendering manager, even the kernel piece, the Penfast, the Penfast project had to rewrite the kernel server. Yes. Got it. Got it. Well, it's always a shame. There's so much wasted effort. But... Yeah. Um... You do what you have to. The, the good news at any is that the Pen Cross kernel driver only has to care about the open source user space. We don't also have to care about catering to ARM's driver that we don't even have the source code for, right? So. Got one less user space to validate and care about. There, so there is an upside. Sure. Okay. So, are there any specific tools used for reverse engineering the ARM, Midgar, and Bifrost? GPUs or for the Apple M1? Uh, so there are a number of tools that could be used. Um, the, the main technique for reverse engineering these sorts of graphics drivers, or really any driver, um, is to have the reference, generally the proprietary driver, and uh, have it running against the hardware, but intercept the intercept that communication. Uh, you have the you know you have the uh, closed source driver here. You have the hardware here, and you stick yourself in the middle and look at everything that's passed back and forth. And doing this allows you to do a, a black box reverse engineering, treating the closed source driver as just a complete opaque black box, uh, and you just study the behavior from the outside, and from that figure out how to how how the hardware works. Um, the main technique that I use, at least, uh, is doing a sort of uh, differential analysis, to use a very fancy term for a very simple idea. Uh, run a program, trace it with the proprietary driver, make one very small change, change one number, change one function call, something like that, and then run it again. Now you have two different memory dumps. Run that through diff, see what changed. Uh, if only one thing changed, well, now you know how to control that one thing in the hardware. Uh, going through every bit of OpenGL or OpenCL uh, and mapping out how everything corresponds to the hardware is certainly tedious, but that's, that's you know, you have to start somewhere. And that's the core technique, and it does build up nicely. So in terms of specific tools for this, uh, the, there are a number of ones you could use. The, inter the actual interception is going to be depend entirely on what the driver in question is. Uh, in, for the case of reverse engineering user space drivers, uh, the way this is going to work is we want to inter intercept the system calls that the user space driver makes. The way we do this is by writing a little library that get, makes our own version of the system calls, uh, IOCTL. Um, and, uh, and so, so on. And our version will dump out all of the state we care about and then pass it to the real ones so our hardware still works. And then we can uh, force the driver to use 
our version of the library functions instead of using the real ones, uh, which will allow us to intercept everything. This on the next, this is going to be using the LT preload environment variable, very versatile, <laughs> very lovely for our secondary. Um, even if you didn't have there be other ways, but certainly it's a convenient one. So that's all I'm going to be dependent on for the kernel. If you're in the case of the Apple and one GPU, if what you're trying to reverse engineer is the interface of the kernel driver talking to the hardware, well, you apply the same idea. You try to trace everything the kernel driver does. In this case, you don't have such a nice abstraction. Uh, you can't just LD preload your way into the kernel. These are actual register writes that you're trying to, to uh, trace. Uh, but fortunately, the Atomic Linux project has a neat solution to this as well. Run your entire operating system in hypervisor, and then every memory access you can trace on the most and uh, do exactly the same technique. Sure, it's very slow, but that doesn't matter if you're only trying to render one frame to see what happened. And just using that technique, uh, uh, Sakina, who many of you may have heard of, uh, was able to reverse engineer the interface required for, that, for the kernel on the Apple One and M1 to drive the GPU. And so all of these are going to be very specific bespoke tools, but they're all doing essentially the same, essentially the same work. So um, for the for the kernel interception technique that you mentioned, uh, did you? Did you, uh, were you running the kernel in user space, or were you running the kernel under emulation? I think I didn't, I didn't catch uh, for, uh, for the M1? For the M1, yes. Uh, it's running on bare metal, but underneath, also on bare metal, is a special hypervisor uh, uh, that, that's able to track all the memory, essentially. Um, this is the brilliant work of Hector Martin. Uh, I can't take credit for that. But I am constantly in awe of the things that that hypervisor can do. Creative, creative, got it. Another yeah, level. Of, really. course, you you want to introduce another level of indirection to trap all the memory yeah. rights? In this case, a hypervisor would do. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this question is about the integration of Penfrost and the DRM HW Composer component used on Android. And, uh -huh. uh, uh, I wonder if you know how well this combination works. I don't do Android myself. I uh, I have enough of my Linux with uh, desktop Linux and other uh, books. Um, I I have heard that uh, I have heard that Panacross works with iOS K at least with some some changes. Uh, it's not something I'm following too closely. Um, I. I, I did look at this issue, I'm not sure what it was about, I'm sorry. Got it. Not a problem. Uh, but uh, we do know that Penfrog works pretty well with the desktop Linux stack, right? Yeah, yes. Um, that's, that's, that's one of my other drivers. <laughs> that <laughs> <any> one. <laughs> Got it. Uh, how about the uh, whatever thing Google runs on a Chromebook? What about a Chrome OS stack? Uh, the the uh, Chromebooks, at least for now, are using the uh, proprietary stack. Um, okay. Well, so was hopefully they'll be using open source graphics stack someday. Right? We, we, we can all we can all look. Yeah, there. Uh, it's my understanding that Chrome OS does work with Panacross, uh, with a special with Chrome OS, um, at least Chrome OS, the open source version. There is obviously a big difference between it being possible to run Chrome OS with the open source drivers and Google actually shipping that on Chromebooks. But, uh, yeah. Understood. So, this question is about the completeness and healthiness of the FOSS mobile GPU drivers in general. How would you sure. characterize them? Um, on the one hand, I can be very pessimistic and note that almost all of the uh, GPU drivers in question are running with on very small teams compared to the prior to counterparts, and so we're not having a good amount of GPU to do. Um, 
the Panthros team has never been more than a couple of people at the same time, and usually only one full time at the given time. Uh, that's, I, I don't know exactly how many people are employees working on their track, but it's a lot more than one. On the other hand, there's definitely cause for optimism. Uh, every, every major uh, modern GPU has a viable open source stack. Some of these are reverse engineered, some of these are contributed by the vendor directly. Uh, this, goes, this goes on both desktop for Intel AMD and NVIDIA, but with Nuvo in the last case. This goes on uh, for the mobile GPUs uh, with Lane Mode, Panda Bar, and B3, 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 and so on. Uh, as was as was linked, uh, even even how we are has gotten on the uh, upstream open source train, and so we're, we're quite happy to have the new face of Mesa for that. Um, so it's always work in progress, but we are we are making progress at least. I think I got like an older version of my questions loaded previously. So okay. let me go to some of the questions that I inadvertently skipped. Okay. Let's, let's get this one. So suppose an unknown vendor releases a new mobile GPU and you, and you get your hands on a good development board. How would you go about reverse engineering it? What steps would you take? Not known vendor. We'll, we'll call them Maple, just for just just for kicks. Yeah, um, Maple. <laughs> Great name. <laughs> no, Maple. Completely unrelated. Unknown vendor. Um, so my first step would be to research as much as I possibly can. Um, it's nice to reverse engineer, but it's even nicer to not have to reverse engineer. Uh, it's possible that there are that there is some amount of documentation that's already been released. Probably not. Uh, probably not specs. If there were specs, I wouldn't need to reverse engineer it. But maybe there was, uh, maybe, maybe there is a public data sheet that just gives general capabilities about, about the hardware. Uh, maybe there there is a guide that this vendor released to uh, to developers uh, that are targeting that platform to giving them tips on how to optimize their code for their GPU. That might have even been a conference talk that they might have presentation slides from or a transcript, say, from WW3C, from this serious company. Uh, this, I'm not sure. Um, if I'm really lucky, it's possible that there's some open source code that they've already released. Maybe not to drive the whole GPU, but a small part of it. Um, in the case of, for, for, for any, any GPU supported by Linux, uh, with one famous exception, uh, there, there should be an open source kernel driver that at least gives you that lowest level of information. Uh, this is the this is the uh, open source ARM kernel driver we were talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, so I would just try to read everything I can and try to learn as much as I possibly can and get myself oriented. Once I finally have all of this background knowledge, I'm in a much better place to understand what my actual task is. What do I have to, what am I supposed to be reverse engineering here? What are the bounds? Where do I start? Um, so my next step, if I'm working on the user space part at least, will be to try to build up this tooling uh, to, to intercept the driver. Uh, this could be very easy if I have an open source kernel driver to work with. This would be very difficult if even the interface between the user space and the kernel space is something I have to reverse engineer, in which case you get this chicken and egg problem, which uh, delayed the initial lap over for me by quite a bit because that was a fully closed source step, which was a bit more challenging. So once I would have, once I would have the, uh, this tooling built up, uh, then I would just get to work with uh, putting a, trying a very simple example program with their driver uh, and dumping memory, making a small change, dumping memory again, and just start figuring out the very first bits. And for the beginning, I'm not going to know. For the beginning, I'm going to be totally lost. Um, I distinctly remember 
at, at one point dumping out the a complete memory dump of the mapped graphics memory uh, from a hello triangle tunnel on the uh, on the M1 GPU. Pull, and just putting the hash dump into my text editor, all the different buffers, and just manually trying to look for values I recognize. Oh, that's a floating point one dot L. Maybe that's maybe that was my vertices that I uploaded, and so on. And, uh, and just try and get oriented. And once you start getting, once you start figuring things out, the most important thing is that then you update your tooling to take it into account. So uh, then, and you start building up a tool uh, to take not just give you a hex memory dump, but to parse this memory dump and start identifying, oh yes, here's a structure, here's a command, here's a shaker, here's a disassembly. And then you have this uh, back and forth ping pong uh, reverse engineering process. First you try to figure something out, then you update your tooling, and now that you have better tooling, it's easier to figure the next thing out. And you just keep spiraling on this until you start getting a pretty good feel for how the hardware works. It's unlikely you will ever reverse engineer completely. There will always be that one magic bit that you don't know what it does. Uh, and in many cases, it's possible I'm doing anything that just got left over or something, or the thing it does is so obscure that it didn't matter. But if you, if you try and spend enough time on this, uh, and with any luck, you will uh, figure out at least enough to write a driver. And, Turns out you, you don't need nearly as much for that as you might think you do. Just get a first try to go up. And uh, yeah, I think, I think that's all the sub questions there. Yep, so uh, what's the first program you'd run on the GPU? Uh, probably a Hello Triangle of some kind. Uh, I, it's a bit of, here's a bit of an open secret. Uh, I, I don't really know how to use OpenGL, or I definitely don't know how to use Vulkan. I don't really know how to use OpenCL. <laughs> I laugh saying these things because obviously I know what the functions do. I've had to implement them. But uh, yeah, for OpenGL, I, one, another Mesa developer, Rob Clark, has a, a whole, whole bunch of OpenGL demos. And I just build those and start t tinkering with those to get what I need. Uh, for, for, the, for the Mac, for the M1, I didn't have that luxury. But Apple does release a bunch of metal example projects. So I started tinkering with some of the Apple demos for that. Uh, but in either case, yeah, the hello triangle, draw one triangle with some smooth shading, see what that looks like. That exercises all the basic functions uh, of the 3D, 3D accelerator. Um, if I'm feeling spicy, I might just I might try a very simple compute shaders alternatively. Got it. So, some like some oh, manual oh, examination oh. of memory dumps in text editors is involved. That takes a lot of mental fortitude. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's these to get frustrated, but uh, this is this is really why the tooling is so important. If you have to keep everything in your head uh, at all times, you would never get past day one. But by app, so as soon as you figure something out, you update your tooling. And now you don't have to remember the computer remembers it for you, and so you only need to keep in what you know one one session worth of reverse engineering, one session worth of magic hex offsets in your head, um, and then after that you can forget about it. But let your script do worry about that because I assure you, your uh, the tool you're building up has a far better memory than you do, or at least my has a than I do. Great answer. This one. So, how do you prevent regressions as you develop GPU drivers? Uh, if you use automated test suites, how do they detect if everything is working as expected? Sure, we have a large number of tests at our disposal. Uh, we have them, uh, the, in terms of integration testing, uh, we have the automated conformance tests, uh, which uh, for OpenGL, OpenCL, and Vulkan, they each have their own performance tests. These are pretty thorough, uh, very large. Uh, in the case of, especially in the case of Vulkan and OpenCL, um, and so these are essentially automated. Uh, they they work by drawing some 
drawing something to the screen, and then reading back what was drawn, comparing it. And then on the CPU, computing the reference image that should have been drawn, doing and then doing a uh, fuzzy comparison to see if it was a valid rendering. Uh, for the compute tests, uh, it's very much simpler. You run the compute shader, you check if it would have been identical to what you were expecting. If so, it's passed. If not, it's a fail. Uh, luckily, the uh, driver developers don't have don't usually have to get our feet when writing these tests because Chrono supplies them as part of the uh, process for the OpenGL or CL or Vulkan implementation to become conformant. So we have those we have those Chronos tests. We have our own target pickup tests, which work on the same principle, uh, but focus on issues that have been a problem for Mesa specifically in the past, uh, and had lots of extra coverage on some of the like city open jail features that the conformant tests uh, miss or don't have adequate coverage on. Uh, these are supplemented in many cases by uh, trace based testing. How these work? Uh, we will capture a trace of all of the uh, OpenGL or Vulkan calls that a given application makes, and then we'll replay them at a later time, and then just render that one frame without needing the rest of the application. And so there are a couple tools for this. Uh, API trace is one, render doc is the other, is the other one. Um, these both work on essentially the same principle. And they have a number of applications. The most, the most obvious one uh, is being able to trace uh, some application that's buggy and then send that trace to a develop, graphic driver developer so that they can try to reproduce your issue without needing to have, you know, buy a fifty dollar game off Steam that you were playing, right? Uh, when they only care about that one frame. But they also has it also has an in application for automated testing because you can. Uh, collect a library of a single frame or just a couple of frames from dozens of different titles and replay each of them and check that the images rendered uh, haven't changed just for the checksum or maybe a fuzzy test. Uh, so that's, that's another way to get uh, more real world workloads as opposed to the uh, performance tests, which are very small synthetic workloads, draw a single, you know, draw a single triangle with a small shader or something. Um, so those are our main, those are the main tools we have at our disposal. Uh, we run these uh, as part of our continuous integration pipeline, uh, pre-merge CI, pre-merge CI for uh, half a dozen pieces of hardware and a big, big busy upstream project. It can get a little bit painful sometimes. Uh, but it makes certain sorts of bugs very difficult to uh, create back in. And then, of course, we have the more traditional uh, methods for correctness, writing in a test of the code, uh, sprinkling in liberal use of assertions, uh, stack analyzer, uh, valve writing, uh, address sanitizers, and so forth. Uh, all of these can help. None of these are so So the, uh, the Kronos test suites are actually pretty pretty useful and for graphics work okay. you, you read back the render results and do a fuzzy graphics compare and uh, the record and replay a few frames tooling from tools like api trace is actually usable and useful nowadays right uh, yes uh, that's uh, that's the learning in our cx makes a lot now uh, yeah cool okay so suppose someone wants to implement a GPU by adding instruction extensions to a general purpose CPU like one of the open source RISC-V designs. Um, how would you go about doing that? How would you go about designing a GPU that's easy to put up with Mesa? Are there any reference books or articles that you would recommend? So this is a bit of an answer. Uh, I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't do that if I were you. Um, the... GPUs are not just CPUs with extra instructions. They are fundamentally different class of machine than a CPU. Um, there are there are things in common, of course. I mean, a floating point atom CPU and a floating point atom GPU—that's the same instruction, right? 
but the computing paradigm is very different. On, on a CPU, the emphasis is on running uh, branch, branch decode in a single thread very fast and having a couple cores. This is very different from what you would have on a GPU, where we're more interested in running the same code you know, on thousands of threads at the same time. Uh, the, uh, the M1 GPU, if I recall, has, uh, can run up to 25,000 threads or 24,576 threads in under good conditions. So that in itself has an, uh, a number of uh, effects on what you would need for the instruction set and what you need for the, for the GPU architecture. Uh, this means that instead of running a single thread on a single core, like on a CPU, you need some sort of, uh, you need some sort of way to uh, vectorize. In the older GPU architectures, you do this with explicit vector instructions. Think uh, SIMD type instructions, so uh, SSC and AVX and XT6, Neon and ARM. I believe RISC-V already has vector extensions for this, this sort of processing. Uh, so that's the older approach. It, turned, it works okay, it doesn't work great. The newer approach is to do this vectorization across, uh, across adjacent threads. Uh, so for, for graphics, you would divide up the screen into, uh, into little squares, say four by four pixels, and then you would run uh, you would run scalar code for each of those pixels, but internally they're all running in, in lockstep at once. And so this is the notion of a wave or a warp or a thread group that, or a subgroup. There are two main names to this. Every vendor has its own. I wish they would stop coming up with names, new names for subgroups. <laughs> um, and so what this means is that the balance of costs for uh, the uh, branching is going to be different. The idioms that you want are going to be different. Suddenly, branching efficiently is so useful, but being able to do a very fast conditional select is useful. Um, for just one very obvious example, for less obvious example, you can make uh, you can make lots of simplifications if you know the same value is going to be computed in at all of these sixteen threads. Maybe you only need to compute it in one thread and have a single uh, scalar register as opposed to computing a different value in every thread, putting it in a much larger vector register. And so an architecture like AMD's uh, GCN instruction set uh, will have this protection in of scalar registers and vector registers. This is going to be completely foreign to the CPU instruction set, but it works out pretty well from what I understand. Uh, you have this notion of subgroups now needs to be directly visible in the instruction set in order to efficiently implement things like subgroups in Vulkan or NCL, uh, or even just to do screen space derivatives in OpenGL, you need to have this quad execution. And so on the instruction set, you quickly realize that you need a lot of changes to emphasize what a GPU wants in terms of performance characteristics. Meanwhile, there are a number of instructions on a CPU that turn out just not to matter all that much on, on, for a GPU, at least for graphics that are close. For example, to my knowledge, nobody is going to implement a division instruction on a GPU instruction set. It just does not make sense. For, for graphics, at least, uh, it's far more efficient to replace a division with a, a reciprocal and multiplication. Uh, that's not strictly correct in terms of the actual release of 54 performance, but it's the efficient thing to do for graphics, and so that's that's what the graphics that's what graphics wants. By contrast, uh, a CPU may well want to have a floating point division instruction, maybe even an integer instruction, neither of which are going to make sense on GPU instruction instruction set. So on one hand, there are lots of things you want for the GPU instruction set to be faster than a CPU, and there are lots of things that are just waste for it. So you find you have a very different instruction set. Um, so in another case, uh, the register file, you want to have a lot, in, for GPUs, you generally want to have lots of registers available, generally uniform registers as opposed to the 
for your sort of special special data storage service that you might find in some of the next six. Um, but you want to be able to dynamically partition them. If you use fewer registers, you should be able to have more threads that can fly at once and switch between them. Uh, the analogy here is the more memory that your computer has, the more processes it can have running at the same time, uh, which it won't let you compute things any faster, but if there are lots of outstanding network requests, or disk requests, then it might let you get better, better bandwidth overall. Uh, the same is true for the register file. Um, this again is going to have various effects for how you design the instruction set. And so all in all, in terms of what you want for the instruction set, you quickly find that if you really want to do your own your own thing. Uh, time, I'm not sure how much you're getting or time yourself to existing CPU instruction. This isn't even this isn't even getting to talk about the things that make GPUs efficient machines in terms of graphics, namely dedicated rasterization units, because you cannot raster on efficiency in software. We tried, it was a complete error, and it failed dramatically. Um, and you can't do texture efficiently in software if you want it to be correct according to what the GL role can be. And so, could you build a GPU that has your own, your own fixed function rasterizer? That's all the hardware you have to design yourself. Your own fixed function texture unit, that's how we have to design yourself. Quite possibly fixed function uh, lending or rasterized operation hardware or attribute building hardware, uniform hardware, uh, any of the above. You don't necessarily need all of this, you might not need any of this, but these are the things you may need to be hardware for. And if you do, that's all on your own. Uh, it, uh, and your own, essentially, your own CPU. Because you're not going to be able to share much hardware with a CPU uh, or sorry, your own shared architecture engine, you're not going to be able to share much with a CPU, even if it has a similar instruction set, just because the control is going to be different. And at the end of the day, you could do all of those things, and then but why would you tie yourself to risk five at that point? If you're going to be building your own thing from scratch, uh, is it such a big deal if the outcome numbers are different than what the ERS file does? So by the way, on the software side, you won't be able to share a compiler later because the uh, software groups, for example, is going to completely change how the compiler looks. You're not going to be able to use the off the shelf LLVM package in the risk file if you want good results on that. You will minimally do it your own thing. That being said, for the follow up question, if you're trying to design one, for being integrated into Mesa, that shouldn't be the concern. Mesa is built for GPP, it's not the other way around. Uh, if, you, if you're trying to build, if you're trying to build an open GPU, build the best open GPU you can, and Mesa will be all ahead. <laughs> That's how we do uh, it. It's checking the cart for It's the hard part here. Is not. I say this as somebody who writes writes drivers full time. The hardware part's not enough drivers, the hardware. If I could be doing the hardware, if I could do the hardware by myself full time instead, uh, that might be a different talk, but uh, I, uh, I know my limits. So, I don't know. That was probably more information than what I was asking, but I. Uh, That's a great answer and exactly what we were looking for. Thanks a lot. We get this question once every now and then, mm -hmm. and it, it always sort of suggests that. People are more interested in fitting in their favorite CPU architecture or their favorite, uh, their favorite NVIDIA representation of compiler and trying to fit that into a hardware as opposed to just trying to focus on the hardware right? because ultimately software is easier than hardware. And I say this as a uh, Windows software developer. <laughs> Some people suggest that a fast GPU driver is good for eliminating e-waste. For example, it allows older hardware to be used in uh, new applications. Do you think it really helps? I hope so. I, that's what I tell myself. I, uh, I, um, I don't know if it really helps. In one direction, certainly, if you have, if you have older hardware that's not supported by the proprietary stack anymore, um, you're going to need a fast GPU driver if you want to have GPU acceleration at all. 
if you take the from book that I that I brought up at the beginning of the talk, uh, you, you know that went out of life and of life as far as uh, Google's Chrome OS is concerned. You won't be able to find ARM drivers for it that support the APIs that you wanted to have. So your options are not to use it or use it with Linux with the open source drivers, essentially. In that sense, I much prefer you to use it. Yeah, I would pick a second one as opposed to buying new devices they didn't need. Do people actually do this instead of just buying new devices anyway so they're faster or shinier? I don't know. I just just like going. So for the Penfrost driver, is there like a list of open for newcomers issues or a starter program so that people who want to jump into contributing can start from? Not explicitly. Generally, people scratch their own itches. Um, if, if you were an employee at Collab, or, you know, maybe you have our to do the list or come through things that we are the customers need, but if you just if you're an open source contributor, uh, you work on you work on what's exchange to do. Maybe that's maybe maybe that's finding a CPU uh, bottleneck and trying to trying to make it faster. Uh, maybe that's trying to implement an optimization to share your compiler. Maybe if you're a venture that's trying to fix a software at the future. Uh, there's not a there's not an open for newcomers list. It's it really has to be self-directed for and maybe that's maybe that's a failure on my part in terms of not having it, not having such a list because maybe I need one because you're not the first person to ask. But uh, I digress. Got it. So, are there any recommended hardware platforms for newcomers to Penfrost to obtain? Uh, sure, sure. It depends on which architecture you're interested in. For the newest Babel architecture, uh, the ref or sort of reference platform. Are the MediaTek 8192 and 8195 Chromebooks, which uh, should be available commercially now and should have been for a while. Um, for the Bifrost architecture, the sort of reference platform there would be the boards based on Molly G52 hardware. Uh, this historically was the Odroid N2 board, and there was an Amlogic one as well. Um, I think there's an i64 board with this now. Um, and of course, to the oldest Midgard architecture, uh, the the reference is sort of the Rockchip 3399 system on chip, which is found in uh, Chromebooks and the Pinebook Pro, and of course, development boards. And is, personally, I use a Rockchip 3399 Chromebook as one of my main machines alongside the alongside the M1 X. MediaTek is, of course, a Taiwanese company. And yes. I, I know Google Taiwan does quite a bit of Chromebook hardware enablement. Yes. And yet, I'm not quite sure if we, I can actually buy the models that you just mentioned. I'll go and ask some of my contacts. Yeah. I, I, I do think they're available, at least in North America. Um, so I would, I would think it's available where you are, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Worst case, you import it, I suppose. Yeah. Probably doable. Okay. So uh, the question is that many tools appears were created for re reverse engineering GPU driver stacks. Um, and maybe some core parts of the tools could be shared. So it, was there an attempt to create some kind of reusable tooling framework for this? Uh, so the, the closest that we have is a project called Envy Tools. Uh, at, uh, NV, the NV here stands for uh, Nuvo or NVIDIA, uh, although the uh, project will tell you that NV tools are people that are, that are envious of the, uh, <laughs> the proprietary driver for NVIDIA in this case. So that's what Nuvo uses. Uh, then the reverse engineered Freedrino and NVIDIA drivers also use NV tools for their respective, uh, for their respective projects. Uh, the, NV tools, uh, the main application we have to the driver itself is providing a way to take high level C structures and pack them uh, into the physical hardware. You know, and these GPU data structures tend to be very dense 
the somewhat esoteric uh, packing. So you don't want to do that in open code and C code. You want you really want to have this this layer of generated packing and unpacking. Uh, the other main tool that we have in Mesa for doing that that packing and unpacking is a tool called GenXML, which originated with the Intel driver, uh, was adapted for the Broadcom driver later, uh, adapted for Panfrost after that, uh, and then later for the Asahi, for the M1, and for the Imagination for PowerVR. Uh, and this does similar tasks. The main difference is that GenXML lives inside of Mesa, uh, whereas NVTools is external, and so this has some implications for uh, the versioning of the build. Uh, aside from that, there are some aesthetic differences, but the bottom line is, yes, we have two such tools for these. Uh, NV tools and GenXML. NV tools designed for reverse engineering. GenXML obviously not designed for reverse engineering, but as it turns out, works out quite well for it too. Guys. So are there any commercial products that's shipping Penfrost by default? Um, I believe so. I'm not able to get specifics due to uh, confidential agreements. Got it. So, how mature is the uh, Pinfrost support for Valhall and Bitfrost? And for both Valhall and Bitfrost, uh, we're passing the conformance tests for OpenGL ES 3.1, uh, which means as far as your embedded work, your mobile workloads. Things should just work. Um, that's not a promise that there are no bugs, but there were no bugs that the performance test could find, at least. And ES3.1 is, uh, it's not the highest level of OpenGLES, but it's the highest one we can reasonably support. So in terms of feature level and maturity there, um, I'm at least quite pleased with how Valhalla and my press are. Uh, for the next one's on your list for Android. Uh, I do know that at least Bifrost uh, was demonstrated and worked with Android at one point uh, with Panfrost. I assume Valhall would be just as easy, uh, at least for the older Valhall that we currently support. For performance and power, uh, I can't say I've done, uh, I can't say that I've done uh, in depth benchmarking of that, but. It's fast. It's fast enough to play to play games on. You know, it's, <laughs> if you're trying to beat the proprietary driver on every metric, you might be disappointed. But if you're trying to have a driver that is good enough for you to use, uh, you will be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> so, so that's, that's that for for reverse engineer drivers, that's actually really impressive. That's close. Uh, so. so Last two questions. So, uh, so if suppose we suppose we were to divide your journey with Penfrost into three stages. Uh, the first stage is from nothing to a prototype, and the second stage is from barely working to working working pretty well, and the third stage is that it works well enough to be shipped in a commercial product. Uh, with the three different stages require different skill sets, and uh, which stage is more interesting in your experience? I suppose they require slightly different skill sets. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not sure I have a great answer for this. I certainly prefer the 0 to 80 than the 80 to 99. But uh, the 80 to 99 is, after all, what people pay for it. The 0 to 80 is what you do on your share time. <laughs> so. Great answer. Yeah, the last 10 or 20 percent, always the hardest. Okay, and then we get to our last questions. Uh, would working on the lower levels of a graphics stack make one a better OpenGL or OpenCL programmer? Well, seeing as I'm still useless in both GL and CL, uh, I'd be lying if I said yes. <laughs> um, ostensibly, uh, you know, having a lower level experience makes it very clear what you can do efficiently on your heart or what you can't. If you, anybody who has gotten near a Molly driver knows better than to use a geometry shader or a tessellation shader, for example. Um, that being said, working on drivers is not going to teach you any fancy rendering techniques. 
It's not going to teach you how to do machine learning effectively. It will teach you how to do, I don't know, floating point math. <laughs> uh, I've read the IEEE 754 spec. You should, uh, I don't regularly recommend the read. It's pretty dry. <laughs> Uh, not, not terribly relevant to writing GL code, very relevant to writing drivers. So, work on it if that's what's interest you. If you want to just become a better GL programmer, write GL code. Do we have any questions from the live audience? Okay, no, so no question from the audience, and we're pretty much out of our time. So, I would like to thank Lisa again for this wonderful talk. Thank you, Elise. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye.